Welcome to Have You Heard, where we talk about issues at the intersection of agriculture and engineering. Let's get started. Here are your hosts, Morgan Hayes and Josh Jackson. Welcome. This is the Have You Heard podcast. This is episode 66. We're going to talk today about rainwater collection systems. I'm Morgan Hayes, an assistant professor in biosystems and agricultural engineering here at the University of Kentucky, focusing on livestock facilities. And in my personal life, I farm in Boyle County, Kentucky with my husband with the commercial cattle and hay operation. And I'm Josh Jackson, a professor in biosystems and agriculture engineering as well, where I focus on precision livestock farming in my home life. We raise registering as cattle, goats, and also focus on some hay production. So uh, before we get started today on the rainwater harvesting, which is uh, tongue in cheek here in our descriptor. Uh, we're just hoping for rain. And this is the topic we're talking about because we're so fixated on <laughs> rain currently. But what's been happening on your farm? Uh, so on the farm, we were able to pretty much raise up some of our equipment, get some equipment going. And so we were going ahead. Uh, the grass is burning up on us a little bit and the Johnson grass and other grasses, what, what little is left. So we're going ahead and cutting it, getting it put down to bale. Yeah. Get, what we, get what we can off it uh, as of right now. Uh, we also you know, we did have a, a calf that was bo- born last last week. We ended up losing it, so I don't know what happened there. Sent off diagnostic lab and just kind of wait wait and see. Um, and then we've also been generally pretty much trying to watch watch for calves that are coming, and then just we're actually still feeding hay to our fall group just because we want to keep them there close by to watch them. Okay. Yeah. So we have um, 32 of 38 calves on the ground. Okay. So six left. Um, I don't know what that percentage is. It's 15 percent ish. I'm going to go with 15 percent. That's as good as my math gets in my head. And uh, we put them out onto a bigger pasture today. So we went ahead, bit the bullet, took the risk and moved them out to grass. We would have preferred to keep them in on hay. But the way grass is drying up, we were concerned if we didn't graze it now, we might not have it to in utilize. two or three weeks hmm. to utilize. Um, it's one of those tricky things. We generally, you know, in this area, recommend stockpiling fescue and doing things like that. And fescue does hold up better than a lot of other grasses. But our mixed grasses that have orchard grass and timothy, things like that, they really don't actually hold up well under drought conditions. And um our clovers are very dry right now. So yep. we're losing a lot uh, of volume just because it's 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 just too dry. Um, we're doing some bush hogging. I'm not sure if that's the best idea right now, just getting weeds knocked down, um, which is sort of normal at this time of year. But at the same time, I'm worried about clipping grass and shrinking up roots when we're fighting a drought too. So trying to clip high and just take weeds and not damage any standing grass that's yeah, I was, uh, I was able to stretch deeper in, in the ground for some water. I want to hope that it's going to find some. I was just in Oldham County, and they were talking about they were going out to put, we saw a couple of tractors going down around, down the road to bush hog. I was like, well, they're knocking down the ironweed and all that ragweed. Yes. But uh, yeah, otherwise, it's like, you know, they're bush hogging, but there's not much there for, for yeah. growth. There's not much water there for growth to take place. Yeah. So that's sort of where we're at. Um, we have, uh, it's it's my younger child's first birthday, so we've been doing a bunch of weed eating as well on the farm, just cleaning up fence rows. We actually have, of our three farms, two are basically completely weed eated. All of our fence lines wow. are. Now we've paid for a number of hours <laughs> of fence uh, weed eating to, to happen, um, but we have a lot of electric fence. We talk about it a lot that we have, we have high tensile smooth wire fences on our interiors. And if you don't you get them knocked down, you don't have a fence. Like once it's not hot, it's not a fence anymore. So yep. it's critical that we get all of that stuff knocked out of there. And we've spent a lot of money on new fence in the last couple of years. We'd like to have that fence last. So we continue to, to pay a little bit of money every year just to keep it cleaned up um, and then do a bunch of work ourselves, a little bit of both happening. So yeah, we, you know, we, we kind of take that approach as we hit it. Every two or three years, we'll like have to go in there and hit it really hard. Yeah. Just because if you let it, you know, let it grow up, get the cedars. But we have, you know, had success, with, at least with the cedars and the goats. Yes. So the goats will go along the fence line. And for some reason, they love cedars. 
And so that's been a, a blessing for us is letting the ghosts just go on there and have, have at it. For us, the rose bushes and the cedars both are pretty dominant in our fence lines. Uh, and if we do weed eat every year, we can keep, we can use string on a weed eater keep map to keep, well, the cedar, it could fight you. It could even <laughs> get big enough in one year to be a problem. But certainly the rose bushes are small enough if we get it completed once a year to keep them knocked down without having to bring in a blade or something like that. Or So we tend to have, we, I don't know how your farm works, but we have four weed eaters on our farm, <laughs> three with blade or three with um, string and one with a blade on it. And that, that seems excessive. I know for many people, but I mean, we have 500 acres we're managing. We, we just have to have the right weed eater for the right purpose and changing back and forth from it's string to blade option. is not practical. So we have up to three people that can be eating at any one time. And we bought one this year, the lighter weight one, and I used it this past week and I loved it. <laughs> I will yes, say that we that's... typically have very heavy duty handlebar. This is a commercial grade, but one of the lighter weight ones. Okay. And I still use um, like a, a strap. No, not the not the crossover strap. The, um, the same type of strap that you would use on your... Backpack. Backpack, okay. That type of a connection. And so I, even with the lightweight one, will still use that just so I don't have to hold the weight of the unit all the time. But it seems, I mean, it was nice. A little bit less vibration just because there's a little bit less weight. So my hands were a little less tingly at the end of the day. Yeah, for ours, so we have, a, we have probably two with the string and then one with almost, it looks almost like, it's not quite a circular saw blade, but it's a yep. blade, a metal yep. blade that yep. we utilize, so... And then we also have just a electric, little electric battery powered uh, Milwaukee hand saw, oh. like little, little chainsaw. The little Milwaukee, it's got five inches for its limbs and branches. Walk through there and just walk along and just knock on all the, you know, seat, little cedars and everything like yeah. that just down. So That's a brilliant it's, idea. It's been quite handy because you know with the big chainsaw, if you get them big enough, and it's, it's always a pain to keep it going sometimes. And, yeah, yeah. But that little electric man, every time I'm, just, I don't even have to wear earplugs. Interesting. Now, with that little electric, do you have to change out your blades and sharpen them the same way you do on a bigger chainsaw? So you do have to. You do have to do some maintenance, and we got the little tools to you know, oh, sharpen it up. And so it, so far, it's been working. Re- I I really enjoy the electric one. I can sit there and listen to music on my phone and walk down line, chop down trees. Clean it. Interesting. Well, that is not our topic for the day. <laughs> Maybe we'll be back with like a little demonstration of all of our fence line clearing tools in another episode. I didn't know we were going to go this in depth today. Um, but let's go back to our topic, which is the rainwater harvesting, because we're sort of at a point right now where water is getting a little bit slim. But also we've had a number of calls like here at our job yep. from people that are looking at water collection, water harvesting, water management systems. This is a really interesting area because we go from it's way too dry to it's way too wet back to it's way too dry very quickly yep. around here. It's just a, the nature of having a lot of clay soils uh, and having pretty high r- total rainfall events. Um, it's just a tricky dynamic. It's, it's tricky. And, and a lot of it, too, is like I have producers who are interested in trying to use this system ideally somewhat year round, but having a backup water source if they lose power, if if they somehow for some reason lost city water in the summertime, would they have a backup source of water? So some of some there's a lot of different interest in having an on farm solution. So some farms don't have a lot of uh, ponds available. And so if they get these in ground tanks or tanks, will that be able to sustain them or how long would it sustain them? Yeah. And so just just thinking, you know, when we're sizing some of these tanks, if we're sizing a tank for producers or, you know, if he's Planning for the merch situation. Um, you know, nothing beats a pond. Sure. Nothing beats a pond. We have that water source. You keep the cattle out of the pond, and we have some type of pump system. That'd be a large reservoir for water that we could use for the animals. Alternatively, um, some of what Steve Higgins worked with is, is the tanks. You know, mm-hmm. it could be above ground tanks. We're concerned mm-hmm. about summertime. It could be in ground tanks. We're maybe considering both year summer round. year round yeah. usage. And so <clears throat> part of what we have to think about, you know, you and I both have to think about when we're designing these is just the, the, size, and the, <clears throat> the size and number of animals and, yeah. and also the, the breed type. You know, is it going to be, you know, dairy cows going up to 40 gallons per day? If you're a mature beef cow lactating, it could be up to, in the summertime, 35 gallons per day. So, yep. And that'll, that'll drop off when we consider the wintertime. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely a seasonal effect. But the capacity is a little bit of a trick because... 
the bigger the capacity is, the higher the cost of the system. Yep. And how reliant do we want to be on the tank versus how much is it a backup system? So some people, they want this to be their primary water. Yep. They want it to be able to cover at least 75% of the days in the year. Yep. And that's a very different system than if you want it to just be a backup for, to be a backup for city water in case there's incident. And even then, so we're talking about you know, maybe some of what you, and you have uh, on your website a calculator for if we're collecting the rainwater, where are we, how are we collecting this? Water? Yeah, well, there's, you know, because I've done a lot of equine work, there's a lot of structures on some of these farms. So some farms yep. that have a lot of tobacco barns uh, or the equine farms where they have barns that the horses are in, plus uh, like if they have an indoor arena, very large oh, yes. surface areas that are covered. And even, you know, some of the crop operations, you know, crop slash livestock, they've got big machinery sheds. Some of these really large structures um, have a lot of impermeable area associated with them. And that's a lot of water that if you directed it correctly, you could store and reuse. Yep. Um, and Governor's Office of Ag Policy here in Kentucky has been very interested in rainwater harvesting. That's been um, an area of interest, something that they've been willing to fund sort of depending yep. on the year and who's in charge exactly how much they're going to fund on that. But but it's certainly something that we have in this area, and it sort of gives us extra resilience on our farms. Yeah, I think, and with that program, I think it's about, for the smaller ones, about $10,000, up to $10,000 cost share. Or, you know, putting in some of these tanks and maybe pumps and, you know, just setting up your system if it's for emergencies or it could be that main water supply. Yeah. So, yeah, and like for me, I've always been interested in, but I have hoop barns, which are not great for <laughs> collecting water off of. Um, particularly, this is useful if you have a gabled structure or even a monoslope would be perfect for this. Oh, yes. Um, because then you only have one roof line and then you're just guttering. Uh, now you, you're going to want to do some work and do some calculations in size and potentially oversize some of your gutters and things to get this to work. But, but yeah, there are options out there we're doing that type of a calculation and ten thousand dollars is not an insignificant cost share on these systems i mean it oh. it won't pay for a huge system but if you already have water lines run on your farm and you already have water tanks and you have a high elevation towards the run front of your farm it's yep. pretty easy to add in a harvesting system because typically those barns are also closer to the road it's just by by nature of how but people how, how, how to back barns put in well, and, how some of those and accessibility for. to yeah. all these things. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting, but there's definitely options out there. And, and we think about, um, you know, some of this, like, so we have that gravity flow system. That's one of the things we have to think about. Where are your waters in reference to this potential tank system? Yep. So that's that's a huge consideration as well. Is it going to be a gravity-fed system? Or do you have to go go involved and get uh, calculate, you know, what size of pumps do we need? It's back to your number of livestock and then how much of a reserve we have and... Uh, the size of a lot. Yeah, and some people, what's interesting that they will do is they will actually collect the water, put a small pump in, and then the reserve tank at elevation and gravity feed the rest of the system. Yep. And that means you can use more of a trickle pump. Whereas if you're trying to pressurize a line or fill, say, a ball water or something like that, you need a little bit more pressure on those water lines to move that water in for two reasons. One, because you need it to refill quickly enough for the cattle to drink or any livestock to drink yep but also a lot of those valves expect a certain pressure on them for the floats and things like that to work correctly so so for two reasons it's more critical with um, some of the commercial tanks that are out there if you're trying to make it transition between both city water and that that you have the right pressures and you talked about the pump at the top or the tank at the top of the hill i think that'd be good for a, a solar system a lot yeah. of the solar solar system, especially because if we're you know sizing for those some of those solar pumps, they only get about two gallons per minute, and so for them to actually fill a tank, it's going to take place over about a six hour period, or you know it's going to take a fairly long time. And it depends on the change in elevation and head, but they're going to be right around two gallons per minute or less. Yeah, which is not what you'd be hoping for if you were filling a tank. I mean, realistically, you'd want eight, ten, twelve, fourteen gallons per minute. Yep. Uh, on a lot of tanks, uh, typical water flow in a house for someone, if they're really curious, is about eight gallons per minute out of most of our faucets. It can vary quite a bit based upon where you are and your local pressure, um, but you would expect to see something in the neighborhood of above five 
probably closer to eight. You could even be up above 10, depending on the size of your water lines and the pressure that you're getting off the city water. And so, yeah. Or so, your well. I guess. <laughs> and, so, and, you know, some of that for producers, if we're going, you know, extremely long distances, it'd be thinking about maybe getting an inch and a half or two inch pipe and right. making sure that they, you know, size it correctly. If they're still putting it, putting it in or if they had put it in, you know, hopefully they put in a larger pipe to account for, you know, traveling that longer distance, taking, uh, eliminating some of that additional friction losses that we see. Yeah, and there's some really nice calculators, NRCS in particular, because they uh, do spec a lot of watering systems on farms, have some really nice calculators. For people that are familiar and comfortable with doing these types of calculations, they're really useful. Yep. Uh, if you have no familiarity at all, this is something where you would reach out to your local NRCS office and ask them to assist you with doing this type of a calculation. This right. is something they could do for a lot of people. Sometimes there's a little bit of a backlog there, but I think for the most part, most of those agents at the county level that work for NRCS are willing to do it. And of course, your your, your ag agent, if you're lucky, one of the extension offices will reach out to us <laughs> if, if you ask them yep. for this. They might be willing to try it as well, but they may also reach out to us. But that it's, it is a really useful thing um, to right. know. And it's nice to know that there are resources out there. Um, one of the things we, we've been looking at recently is that there are some websites that have whole systems. And this is really useful. This is similar with solar panels and off-grid solar and some of that that I also work with is sometimes buying the whole system together, even if it costs a little bit more than what you can price out individual pieces for, there is value in buying a system that has a backflow preventer, that has a pump, uh, that has yep. valves. Um, uh, control, like uh, pressure controls. Pressure controls, all of that into one system and that they all work together can be really useful. Yeah, that, that can definitely be a huge benefit, just having uh, almost a, more of a plug and play instead of having producers having to figure out what individual component. Because there's a lot of websites you look and find a pump, it would work, but it's also a little more expensive. And then getting that pump to integrate into your system can be yeah. a challenge. Yeah, and especially if you're trying to integrate something that you don't know what, maybe like you have, have power, but you don't always have power, or you want it to be solar, yep. uh, well, then you don't want to be choosing the wrong pump that runs off of 12 volt and you're running a 24 volt solar system. So all of that can be challenging. And sometimes you have 120, 115 type voltage. If you have power associated, sometimes you can, you have enough capacity on your box to put in something on a 230 type of, all of that can be a okay. little bit tricky. And once you buy the pump or the part, pump in particular is the most expensive part of these and, systems. And then just making sure that you know, if you have that, if you bought this pump, can there be replacement parts or where can yes. I get replacement parts for these pumps? Is it something that's going to be commonly available, still supported? So there's a lot of little things and you know, there are, you know, systems for the solar as well that can give you a higher flow rate than I talked about the two gallons per minute. There are what systems that can give you a complete system that can be sized for, you know, you want higher flow rates and right. be a little more costly. And you yeah. just think about what is my power source is, is what my power source is, is a huge concern. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's probably the biggest concern in the whole entire design because the water around here, despite the fact that we joked about sort of hoping for rain and that's why <laughs> this topic at the top of mind this week, um, we do get a lot of rainfall around here. It just tends to come in bits and spurts and this time of year tends to be dry. So yep. hopefully we get some rain in the next couple of weeks. It looks like there's a little bit of a projection for some rain next week. But what we don't expect is necessarily that we're going to capture every bit of rain that happens. So if we have a two inch rainfall event in December, I don't need all two inches of rainfall to make it into my tanks necessarily if I think there's going to be rain the following week. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to size my system and I'm going to accept probably that I might have to use some city water here between August and the end of October. Yes. Uh, and maybe a higher percentage of my water usage in that time period I'm going to pay for. But then in the spring, maybe I don't have to pay for water at all from January 1st <laughs> <laughs> till about the middle of May. <laughs> till the middle of May, or even it depends on the year. It could be going into June, but then right. at some point, you know, shutting off, we want to have that reserve water supply. A secondary system. A secondary of some, system. Of some form or fashion. Yeah. If something was to happen to the, to the water, you know, city water, we'd have that reserve there. And some people just have backup cisterns and other things that they have rather, or a well, rather than using, that's the one thing we haven't talked about at all is really a well. Well is, could be a reliable source. Yep. 
as an alternate to having a city water as your primary. But certainly if you're on well water and you're fully dependent on it, you want to have a plan in place to replace that pump if something would happen to a well pump. Yes. They tend to be a little bit more reliable. They're intentionally built to have a long lifespan. Some of these smaller ground yep. above ground pumps. But pumps might they not. also tend to have less sediment in them, which helps. Um, that is one <laughs> yeah. of the challenges with some of these water sources. That's one of the reasons rainwater harvesting into tanks can be so good because with yep. the first flow diverter, we can get a lot of sediment out of our waters, and that's really nice. And the other thing to think about is, I've seen this on at least one well pump they put into a pond, which, and then it was uh, they went through two well pumps and kept they saying, "What's what's our problem here?" And so I went out there and said, "All right, well, it's a well pump; it needs to be in a pipe, so you get a velocity of water around yes. it, as opposed to you know it's sitting there, it's running, but it's not going to have velocity of water to help cool it." So sometimes yeah. you know you have to really read the instructions on some of these pumps of how how it should be set up. Yeah, that's that's a very good point that those pumps actually self cool based upon the speed of the water. So it is really important that they have the correct piping or diameter pipe around them. Yes. So that 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 was something we we went through and like, oh yeah, that's this is what's taking place here. Yeah, but, but it's, it's just... not intuitively obvious at first glance what the problem is, and then after a little bit of investigation, we... why is this burning up? And then we directions. <laughs> So, so sometimes it can be something as simple as that, but uh, you know a lot of you know, a lot of producers I think are interested in this type of system. It's just you know what do they need to do to size it? I think sometimes yeah. it's just for us it's figuring out the tank size and it could be the pond could be a good resource and like you said another well well could be a good option. Yeah, yeah, I think there's lots of things out there, but that rainwater harvesting system is a really nice way to utilize water that is otherwise going to create muddy messes at certain times of the year and to, to decrease decrease the cost that you're paying for city water if it, if you are currently using that as your primary or only water source farm and i i know like uh, in talking to some producers just this past week they were paying 100 to 200 dollars for that for about a hundred you know 75 to 100 cows in essence oh i think i pay more and and, and so <laughs> but this, this is and, and pl in addition to the fixed cost of just having that uh, yeah. water line out yep and and so, or water excuse me the water meter out yep. there and, and so they were trying to say, what, what can we do to reduce some of this cost here? Yeah, because a lot of people will say that it, they can't afford to pay for water. And I've always said I can't afford to not pay for water if it keeps me from having issues with lepto on my farm. Yeah. Because uh, a breed, a reproductive disease is far more costly to me than than the water bill is. But, but I do now have water uh, connections, meters on four different places. And that's that's four bills that I pay thirty five to forty dollars a month just to have service at four spots. So yes, I'm I'm clearly I'm at one hundred and sixty dollars <laughs> just on or close to that just to have service at all those spots. Um, and that's not something that's going away. I just have accepted that because I have rented land and other pieces of. That's just how it works. I can't run all the water off of one meter. And, and it's you know it's a challenge on some of those. Uh, as well, because if you have to go in a, onto a farm and put in a meter, so that's an, another very costly investment. There might be some ways to offset that with CAPE funding and other stuff. Sure. But sure, it's still a, you know, it could be, I think in Mercer County, maybe a 1200 used to be 1200 I think, and now it's $2,000 investment. Yeah. Yeah, the meters are pretty expensive as well. So certainly um, not, not to be it, diminished the importance of saving the money. But, you know, the other thing is that you can get a good quality water yeah. off of that harvesting um and pretty fresh water especially if you size that tank correctly um so i know that the question we're going to get from someone is going to be how much capacity do you want to have in the tanks um and i would say you comfortably want a few days yes of storage but i don't know that you want more than a week of storage i think everything that i've read says two or three days of storage is usually cost effective yeah. um once we get up above five days it, it's just pretty expensive it's Usually too expensive. Yeah, when I, when I was working with uh, producers up kind of towards northern Kentucky, it was pretty much sizing it for three to four days. Three three yeah. days. I was like, we'll plan for three days. We haven't figured out three days. And they were saying there's no real good ways for them to truck water in. And I was yeah. like, well, the, the amount of water they were needing is like, yeah, you'd have to make more than a couple runs with some IBC crate if they lost water completely. Yeah, and bringing water in that way, especially if you don't have a larger tank than an IBC is... 
uh, painful. I know I'm watering it. I, right now I have six deers that are on a side of the road that we don't have a meter on um, that we're finishing. So they're right at the end of their life cycle. And it's been pretty warm for the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, and so we've been using an IVC to water them to a tank. Um, every, about every three visits. So about if I meet one morning, the next, not the next morning, but the next afternoon. So a day okay. and a half. Um, yep. And that's a lot of water. Uh, it seems like more water than six steers should be using, but that is pretty consistently... <laughs> You know they're they're using 300 gallons yep which is you know 50 gallons in a day and a half uh which is you know more than i would have expected i would have expected that 50 gallons each would have lasted them for about two two and a half days but it's been fairly hot and dry and they're on hay and they're they're finishing so they are yeah. not being given access to any green grass current so they're not bringing in any moisture through forage and they're bringing it all in through water intake. So other challenge of moving some of that stuff, moving those IBC crates with water is like we had a 50 horsepower tractor with pallet forks and it, we had, a, we had eventually put a dot on the tank just so you like, don't fill above this line mm -hmm. before moving with the tractor. The skid steer can handle the whole thing with water, but the uh, tractor, you know, at some point we had to get a little more weight on the front end to just to move it down the road. Yeah. We had to put it into one of our farm tr trucks. So it's in the bed of the truck right now, which works fine, but that means that truck is out of commission for a lot of other hauling that it would typically do. So um, it's fine. Fortunately, we got one of our trucks back, so we have two <laughs> functional farm trucks right now. Uh, makes it manageable. Yeah, and it's it's just some of these tanks, you know, if we're moving a long distance, driving down the road with a skid steer is not... not it's not safe or practical. Yeah. yeah. Okay, before we end for the day, now that we are off on IBC crates. So <laughs> okay. Another topic for another day. Let's let's give them a goal or two for this week on the farm. Uh, this week on the farm, we're still hopefully raking and baling and rolling. And then then we're also, we said we we're going to spread manure last week. Maybe we'll get to it this weekend after we knock on wood, get everything done. Yep. We also have a little bit of hay to bale. Um, rotating cattle. I think we're about done bush hogging. I don't think we have any more bush hogging on the near agenda. I'm hoping not. It looks like it's pretty dry. Um, we may have to feed a little bit of hay to some groups, and we have to move some animals around just to get things in the right location. Okay. Um, I'm hoping no feeding of hay this week. I'm hoping we get another week or two before we have to start that. To really start feeding October, maybe. We have a couple bulls that will probably they're not going back in with the cows until November, they'll probably but I think we've got one more field to rotate them through they go on. Sounds good. With that, we'll thank everyone for joining us and we'll see you guys next week with another podcast. Thanks everybody. Have You Heard is a production of the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture Food and Environment along with the Department of Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering. Discover what's wildly possible at ca.uky.edu.